Welcome back here to the ADSA here in Ottawa, Canada. With me for this session is Dr. Pete Morrow. Pete's a uh, technical service manager for Balcom Corporation. Pete, I understand you are a bit of a neighbor to our next guest here. Would you mind introducing her for us? Yes, this is uh, Faith Reyes. Uh, she uh, grew up about 20 miles from where I uh, currently live and uh, practice from, during my practice days. So yeah, under one of these small world moments, you have to come halfway across the world to meet your neighbor. Yeah. You know, and understand, Faith, uh, welcome. Glad to have you here that uh, your, your professor was unable to make it, a little bit of flight delays. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about Dr. Van Oes? Yes, so I've actually worked with her for about four years at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, she's a professor in dairy animal welfare. And my focus has been a lot in adult cows uh, and competition at the feed bunk, but she also expands research with calves as well in the thermal stress portion. And so she is very um, excited in trying to create practical, ap practical applications for the industry that involve uh, from a welfare perspective that we can imp implement to help dairy producers. So you had mentioned uh, competition at the feed bunk and that's where I understand your research was in. Would you mind telling us a little bit about that? Yes, so a lot of my research was involving adult cows and that peak lactation 50 to 150 days in milk and looking at competition specifically at the feed bunk. So in this case, not looking at, at the resting stalls, but feed bunk only, uh, and manipulating that stocking density to see how it impacts competition, and then how does that relate to the feeding patterns that we're seeing, and how, what can we do to think about implications with increased competition and changed feeding patterns. Okay, interesting. So, and so we actually looked at, in my particular study, three different stocking densities. So what we call one cow to one bin, uh, and I say the word bin, in this case we're working with Incentec bins or roughage intake control bins. And so each cow can specifically be assigned to a certain bin. And this allows us to calculate things like individual cow intake and eating rate and multiple types of feeding pattern variables. And we were able to compare a 1 to 1 stocking density to a 2 to 1 stocking density all the way up to a 4 to 1 stocking density. All right. And did you find it? Is competition good in this case? So in a general sense, we like to see decreased competition. Um, and a lot of previous literature has showed that usually there's a linear relationship. Increased stocking density leads to um, increased competition, if you will. And what the interesting thing we found is actually there was a, the most competition at the two to one stocking density, which was actually higher than the four to one stocking density. And so here, again, we weren't quite sure what to expect. That kind of surprised us a little bit. Um, but I think it goes back to individual cows and their own strategies on how they approach competition. And so perhaps they knew I might not win the competitive interaction to be able to eat at the bunk right now, so she chose to just avoid that situation. That's interesting, mm -hmm. yeah. So f from a production standpoint, how did the, uh, the, uh, the higher levels of stocking density change the net effect or net dry matter intake? Good question. So in our in our case, we uh, did a two hour feed deprivation beforehand to be able to consistently try to control, if you will, for that feeding motivation. And then we tested each of the cows in a one hour testing period. And so it is a little bit of shortened. It was, wasn't over across a, a 24 hour period. But within that one hour, we did see that there was a decrease um, in dry matter intake across uh, as, as stocking density increased, dry matter decreased. <laughs> So in, in a linear fashion or? Correct, in a linear fashion, yes. Do you think that it was a significant, you know, maybe even statistically significant? Do you think it was biologically significant for milk production? We have the milk production data. Uh, and I did not bring that with me today, so we're still working through some of that. Um, but it was statistically different. The biological part here, I mean, it was a, a, a couple kilograms, or, but in a general sense, I think it, we do have to keep in mind that it was measured within a one hour period. And previous re research has shown that over the course of a day, a cow will adjust uh, and try to react, you know, readjust and be able to in intake that feed, even if it's at a different time of the day. And so I also think it'd be interesting to look at this in a longer period to see, does the cow change her strategy that if maybe they can't eat feed right away, but they'll go come back to the bunk later on. Do you, uh, can you look at the stocking density in your treatments and correspond it to a, a stocking density in a, in a traditional barn, whether it be inches of bunk space or? 
Yes, great question. So the Incentec bin design is a little bit different than a headlock, so it's a, a gate system that comes down. Uh, but there has been literature that's showing that there are similar patterns between both systems. And so from a research standpoint, we find it really helpful to have those individual cow intakes. Uh, and so, again, slightly different from a headlock, but there are similarities in what we've seen with the data. And even from uh, the, the stocking density standpoint, the one-to-one -one is kind of been considered the ideal, if you will. Uh, and then that I've seen all the way up to about 120% in a headlock setting and sometimes higher from an anecdotal sense. And so that Incentec bin is about, I think, 0.8 meters um, and for, for space. Uh, and so the 0.6 is usually that benchmark that they're looking for. And so depending on how you d define that at the feed bunk with the headlock system or not, that can vary. But the Incentec system is comparable. So, uh, but this wasn't a factor of crowding the pen in terms of cows still had, each had one bed per cow or? So actually in these testing scenarios, they, uh, because it was only for an hour, we locked them over to just a feed bunk part of the pen. So they weren't able to lie down, they just had water access oh, okay. and an area to be able to remove themselves from the feed bunk if needed. So you had talked a little bit about cow strategy. I'm just kind of wondering how much of that is it strategy or is it just social adaptation? You know, kind of getting used to each other. That's a good question. And so again, we're, I was only able to look at this one hour period, but I really do think that comes into play, especially over time. We already know that cows have a social hierarchy and that higher dominance to lower dominance is something that we can look at. Uh, I didn't look at that specifically, but the strategy part plays into potentially how dominant an animal is or how uh, much she wants to compete at the feed bunk. And so part of my other work was actually looking at individual cow strategies related to how consistent they are. So uh, if an animal is a higher level of competition at the one-to-one, -one, does that remain the same at a two-to-one? So if she's competitive at one stock intensity, does that remain consistent? And we actually found that it's a little more complex than we expected. Uh, and so some animals are more consistent, other animals not so much. And we're still working on what, what can that tell us? Because what we really don't know yet is consistency good or bad. Uh, and it's definitely something we're still diving into. Right, yeah. More research needed, as yeah. always, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, kind of another question I've got is, so is, is four different than 50, right? And, and, and do cows kind of find their own little clicks within uh, larger groups and, and how does that, I know that's probably wasn't part of your research, I, I'm sorry, I'm just <laughs> going off the deep end here, but yeah, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I guess it's interesting and I guess to clarify too, the, the groups that I was looking at were 16 cows, so four to one being like uh, 16 cows to four bins, so a little bit bigger groups, um, but definitely not as large as what you might see in a commercial farm. Right. And so there has been studies where they may rank cows based on their dominance level. And even when they take out the dominant cow, the most dominant cow, uh, that can still make a difference. But ultimately, you know, they still restructure, right? So each group kind of is fluid, if you will. If, if staying together for a longer period of time, they readjust. And so I think it's something we could look further into is, is this group size making a difference? Um, because it makes a difference for potentially the available space at the feed bunk and the management side of how much space do you need to physically have for a larger group versus a smaller group. But that type of angle is, hasn't been investigated yet. Mm -hmm. How do you feel that your research impacts the industry in a practical standpoint? Yes, great question. Uh, and I think it helps us provide insight to specifically that individual cow strategy. I think a lot of the data streams today, it, it boils down to an individual cow basis, um, but also knowing how to interpret that and then use it on farm. So understanding that all cows might not approach feed the same way, and how can we change management practices to adjust for that? Um, whether that's reducing competition at the feed bunk, is there a way we can feed in that way? Um, I can't, don't have a full silver bullet answer today, uh, but I think it helped add to that knowledge and understanding that, again, those higher stock intensities still have negative implications and the ideal situation would be that lower stocking density. Okay. What are you going to recommend to the dairies that you visit? I would say ideally uh, that one-to-one -one stocking density is what we're still working towards, um, but I also understand that certain farms, you know, they have 
very high management protocols and they're working within their realms and they can actually utilize higher stocking densities for very positive outcomes. And so I think it's a combination of facility and management when it comes to stocking densities. And there can be success stories at those higher, um, just not recommending that four to one extremely high stocking density. <laughs> that one so far has been negative implications. A little scary at that level. Yeah. Yes, yes. Well, Faith, I want to thank you for uh, joining us today. This has been quite, uh, I should say, actually, Dr. Faith. I understand you got your uh, PhD recently. Uh, what, what's your plans uh, going forward here? Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm actually staying within the University of Wisconsin system, working at in the Division of Extension as a statewide dairy outreach specialist. All right, very well. I'm sure you'll be successful. Thanks thank again you. for joining us today. Thank you both. Thanks, Dean.